So unfortunately, one of the things I see a lot is students that did really well on their bone practical do not quite as well on their muscle practical. And that in large part has to do with the fact that generally for a muscle practical, you're going to need to understand actions. So I want to explain what I think is the most logical way to do that. Um, but first, I'm going to give you some general tips about how to think about muscles to remember the names better. A lot of the time, the name of a muscle is a word that you already know with an IS or a US tacked to the end. You already know the temporal bone, the temporal region. Let me introduce you to the temporalis muscle, which is just temporal with an IS on it. You know the word triangular. Well, there's a triangularly shaped muscle on your face called the triangularis. There's no reason to have trouble spelling superioris because it's just superior with an IS. So once you take note of that, I think that makes it a little bit easier. And another thing I'll point out is that muscles, sometimes they end in an I-U-S, sometimes they end in an E-U-S, but they're never going to end in O-U-S because O-U-S is a suffix that you use on an adjective like gorgeous, nervous, wondrous, and you just don't see it at the end of a muscle name. So if you've spelled something out and there's an O-U-S at the end, check your spelling. One of the nice things about muscles is that a lot of the names are very descriptive. It might tell you something about the shape, the location, or even the action that the muscle is doing. That's my favorite when it includes the action because it's like two for the price of one. If you know the name, you know the action. So an example of one that tells us about the shape and the location would be the quadratus femoris, which, surprise, surprise, is a square-shaped muscle attached to the femur. The levator labi superioris is a muscle that elevates the upper lip. Notice levator is just the word elevator without the E on the front, lay by means lip, and superioris because it's the upper lip. The extensor carpi radialis tells you that it's going to extend the wrist, it's on the radial side, and we put the longest at the end because there's one that's right next to it that's smaller. So the extensor carpi radialis longus is a little bit bigger than the extensor carpi radialis brevis. Think brevis, brief, short. So that wraps it up for my general tips about how to recall the names. So now we're gonna talk about what I think is most important, which is how you can stop trying to memorize the actions and start trying to understand them. Because just like the function of anything else in the human body, the action of a muscle isn't random. There's a bunch of things you can think about which are going to help you make sense of it. But before you even get started with that, I would recommend you just review all of the basic action terms. So some of those terms, like flexion and extension, you're going to see at many, many joints across the body. Some of them are highly specific to certain body parts. 
for example, supination and pronation, that's something you're only going to see in the forearm. Don't worry about having them all memorized 100%. You just want to have some knowledge you can build on and something that you can refer back to so you aren't walking in blind. So once you've done that, you can start thinking about the actions of individual muscles. I'm going to use this muscle on the thigh called the vastus medialis as our example. The first thing you want to do is think about what are the points of attachment. So consider what the muscle is attached to, and that's called the origin and insertion, because that's going to tell you what joint the muscle is crossing because the joint that the muscle is crossing has to be the joint that's going to move. So in the case of the vastus medialis, the origin is high up on the anterior femur um, by the intertrochanteric line. And the insertion is down on the tibial tuberosity because the muscle is attached to this tendon and that tendon attaches to the tibial tuberosity. So what joint is it crossing? The knee. So once you've identified it's the knee, you know it has to do some kind of movement at the knee. So next think, well, which movements can the knee possibly do? The knee is nice and easy because it's a hinge joint, so it can really only do two things, flexion and extension. But it's important that you're able to actually do that motion. You should know what that motion looks like. So you should know that knee flexion is when you're bending your knee and knee extension is when you're straightening your knee. And the reason you need to understand that is because what you can do is picture the muscle just like it's a rope. The insertion is always going to pull towards the origin. That's why we define them as such. Muscles can only pull in one direction and it's always the insertion pulls closer to the origin. So if this is the insertion and I hook a rope here and I pull that rope back closer to my origin, what is going to happen to my knee? So that would be knee extension or straightening the knee. So let's look at another example of how to do that by using the temporalis muscle. So the temporalis has an origin up on the skull and the insertion point on the coronoid process of the mandible. So that means it's crossing your temporomandibular joint. And you can imagine if this insertion pulls back towards the origin, that's going to pull the whole mandible upward. So we call that elevating the mandible. Elevating the mandible, AKA closing your jaw. Lastly, let's look at the anterior digastric. So that is this muscle here. The origin is on the inner part of the chin. The insertion is down on the hyoid bone. Now, if the insertion pulls towards the origin, that's going to elevate the hyoid bone. And that's how most muscles work most of the time the insertion is going to be attached to the body part that's actually going to move. However, 
there can be times when the origin moves. If the insertion point is held into place, if it's fixed in place, then if the muscle is contracting, the origin is going to move. So in this case, if the hyoid cannot move and this muscle is getting shorter, it's still pulling in the same direction, but because that hyoid is trapped into place, the mandible is going to get closer to the hyoid, which means you're going to depress the mandible. You're going to lower the mandible. So I really think the ideal situation is that you want to use pictures or models when you're learning the actions. Because as you just saw, you can really tie the action to the physical location of the muscle. If you're going to use flashcards at all, I would use them to review what you already understand. However, if you can't do it that way, for whatever reason, maybe you have a really crazy work schedule, I suggest you at least know the muscle location well enough where you can picture it in your head and think about all of those things I just mentioned. And if you can't do that, um, you really just have to jam it all in your head by blind memorization. I suggest you at least review it while looking at pictures and see if you can correctly state the actions while looking at a picture um, rather than your flashcard. Because even if you can get the information out of your brain with your flashcards, the memory could end up so tied to your flashcard that you can't get it out of your brain without the flashcard. And then on your test, you might just blank and be unable to recall that information. So at some point, you need to work on keeping your brain flexible by reviewing the information in a context other than your flashcard or your Quizlet or whatever else you're doing. You can reinforce the actions by visually grouping your synergists. So a synergist is a muscle that's doing the same action. So you're gonna find them going to and from a similar place. So for example, remember we looked at that vastus medialis and we said it extends your knee, it straightens your knee. Well, you're going to find the rest of the knee extensors going to and from a similar place. They're all going to be inserting onto the anterior tibia. And when you pull on the anterior tibia and bring it closer to your femur, that's going to straighten your leg. So you can find them all grouped on the front of the leg. When you're studying, you can either print out a picture to shade or shade it on your iPad, or you can just go around the model or picture and verbally identify them by their action. You just want to be able to see that group and just take note of the pattern that there they are all right on the front of your leg. So you're going to look for the antagonists in the opposite place. So if I'm looking for an antagonist of a knee extensor, I'm going to be looking for a knee flexor because an antagonist is a muscle that does the opposite action. So we had all those synergists grouped together in the same place on the front of the thigh. All of the knee flexors, all of the antagonists are found in the opposite place, inserting onto the posterior tibia. You might not always be able to intuitively know where the opposite place is going to be, but if you just find the groups, you should be able to see the pattern. So I hope everything was clear. Please let me know if there was something that didn't make sense or if you would like to see a video with more examples of something in particular. The only thing I have left to say is 
please, please, please do not save the actions for last. I see students do this every semester where they learn all the names and then three days before their test is the first time they even start thinking about the actions. It's definitely something you wanna do little bits at a time because your brain needs time to get used to thinking in this way. So my suggestion is get comfortable with all the muscles in any given region. You could do the entire head, entire neck, all of your shoulder muscles, whatever. Then once you know that, you should start working on the actions before you move to the next region. So you don't have to learn it all in one day, maybe learn names one day and then learn actions the next day, but you just shouldn't save it until, okay, I know every muscle in the body and now I'm gonna try to learn all of the actions. All right, so those are all my tips. Have a great day and have fun learning.